everyone. Thank you for attending our finance subcommittee meeting. We have a, um, uh, a busy night um, at um, 6.45. We will need to adjourn and um, take a vote with respect to the issue of school choice. So we need to step it up. Madam Superintendent, okay, um, the floor is yours. I'm going to begin by um, going over the um, budget barometer. And I am going to ask uh, Chief Budget Officer Aldo Petronio to join me up front. There really hasn't been any changes since last time. And I want to make sure that uh, the school committee, I know we've had a chance to have some discussion. I want to remind everybody that this is at this particular point in time where we stand. Also, I want to state that we have not had an opportunity to go before our city council or to be given figures uh, for our city budget. You will have an opportunity to hear uh, Jay Condon this evening. He will be present during our meeting and speaking to you um, about the budget. Um, so again, I'm asking again for patience as we work through this process. Uh, a number of you have certainly been through this before and will continue to advocate for additional funding uh, from our city, uh, from our state, and from uh, all avenues possible. So in looking at our budget, um, you see again, I keep reminding everybody that it is not the superintendent's recommended budget. Um, the school committee proposed budget was 177 million. The mayor's recommended budget is coming in at approximately, because I do not have a figure yet there. I did speak to the mayor this week, and this is pretty close to being accurate. I know they're just finishing up their budget process at 161. Because of that, we have a $16 million deficit. As we have gone through uh, numerous meetings, looking at everything from programs um, to materials, supplies, um, extracurricular clubs, I mean, we have gone through everything possible per capita. I mean, the sheet goes on and on, the cuts that we have made to, at this point in time, balance the budget. I will remind everybody, I wish the date was not May 15th, but that is a contractual date. We have asked the BEA in the past if it is a date that we could push out, although quite honestly, I understand at this point, if it was June 15th, I probably wouldn't have any more accurate picture than I probably have right now. So in saying that, we contractually had to meet our obligations as a committee and as a school department in trying to balance our budget. And a $16 million deficit has been yeoman's work on trying to do this at all. So the pink slips did go out. Um, this past Friday, it was a very difficult day in the Brockton Public Schools. Obviously, it's been on uh, state media outlets. I know all of you have been asked about this. And again, I want to caution everybody that this is at this point in time. So there were an elimination of 137 uh, plus 6. That brings 143, the total of eliminated positions. Because of the so-called things that Dr. Moran told you can happen. There can be ties in particular seniority list, et cetera. We did need room, and the pink slips that went out totaled 179. That does not mean there are 179 eliminated positions. That on top of administrative positions and those that were affected by the May 15th date have gone out. And I also want to remind everybody, because this seems to be a, a topic of concern, is there are for non-union members, administrators, executive team, some principals, associate principals, every one of them also has a so-called pink or blue slip. And I will remind everybody that it's at this point in time. So the budget has not changed from when we last left. I will also let everybody know there was a question, I believe, from uh, Mr. D'Agostino asking about the budget barometer. So on our new website, and it will go up this week once you approve it going up, we will have um, actually areas on our website where you can get the finance subcommittee meetings, you can get the budget barometer update. So as we go throughout the summer, families and constituents can look and see the deliberations, the conversations, and how Hydro working to try to balance this budget and allow us to work as a school district going forward, actually stabilizing the district as best we can. So I do want to, the other thing that I will tell you most recently, we actually had questions from um, our Congressman Stephen Lynch, and he's in a long line of people that are out there looking at our situation and trying to advocate for what we need. What we decided to do, because we've told the story numerous times, is to put together a sheet for you 
explaining exactly why we are at a $16 million deficit with information and a narrative. And this is this document right here that should be in front of you. So it talks about FY18, $16 million Brockton schools budget crisis. If you look at this, and again, there is narrative backup. You have uh, under lost revenue, we're going to call it, of about 4.3 million. Now let me just go before the numbers, and then I'll quickly do, we don't have a lot of time tonight, but we'll quickly do um, a list of um, targeted points that I want to attribute to each of these things. So Scott, excuse me, charter school tuitions totaled 4.3 million of what we're calling lost revenue for the district. Now whether that's the students that left for New Heights, the 235, or an additional 90 for extra seats at a couple of the neighboring Foxborough Charter and South Shore Charter were the bulk of our loss in that funding. And I want to remind everybody, when you look at a district like Brockton, your per pupil cost is over $11,000. And it's a blended rate. It blends in there the work that you need to perform for English language learners, special education students, students in poverty. All of that is in that blended rate. And when you look at traditionally, and this is something that has been looked at by the state auditor and numerous organizations, those are not the students leaving for charter school. The average student that you educate in Brockton is about a $7,500 cost to us as a district. Very different when you lose dollar for dollar that $11,000 calculation and you see what that cost is. And when you look back last year, the mayor uh, and our city paid out under Schedule 19 about $7 million in that kind of a loss to either school choice or charter school reimbursement. This year, it went up by that $4.3 million. So you can see that the seven turned into close to $12 million, which is allowed to be held against the net school cost that they give us towards our foundation budget, and I'm talking about the city. So that's number one. Number two, you had the last year of a collective bargaining agreement with your Brockton Education Association. Every one of your teachers out there deserves every penny of that raise. Make no mistake about it. You understand what they're dealing with. You advocate for them better than anybody else. They were given a contract, a three and a one year contract when we bargained. Over four years, it's about a little over 2% a year raise. We ended up backloading that contract, our hope was, with the Foundation Budget Review Commission, which you hear me talk about, talking about all over the state, an increase for poverty, an increase for special education, looking at you know, different, our bilingual students, which again, large numbers in our district. So that advo advocacy on our part came out in a document to the governor back in the fall of 15. The governor had been in office at that point about nine or 10 months. They still have not acted on that Foundation Budget Review Commission report which should have been extra dollars to gateway cities and districts like Brockton. And again, in looking at our bargaining, those were some of the things we had taken into account. You have your yearly BEA step and grade increases. Those are teachers that go from a bachelor's to a master's, to um, a CAGS, to a doctoral degree. So those are things that happen year to year, whether they're here in their first year, second year, third year. Those are increases we deal with every year. That's 2.5 million. Other union and non-union increases totaled uh, 1.4 million, and again, they were simply based on about 2% raises across the board for just, and many of you bargained those raises when you bargained for your um, non-BEA union contracts. And they were pretty much the same for each of the uh, bargaining units. Our employee health insurance that continues to go up, not just in Brockton, it's very difficult for any of us trying to contain health insurance. It's a national conversation right now. In our city, and this is an estimate, it's up about $1 million. Your retiree health insurance. When you talk about the perfect storm, for a number of years, our retiree health insurance and 192 other districts across the state. With that retiree health insurance, the city was not allowed to count that towards their contribution to our Chapter 70 meeting foundation. Over the past, and I believe we're in year three, it's a four-year cycle. They're allowing us to actually each year come up with 1.3 million extra that the city gets to count against meeting our foundation budget. So that is a direct loss in funding to us, which we will have again next year. And then we will be done with, we will stabilize and even out from that loss. 
And our last year, when we do the pre-buy, we have to put back that money in our SPED account for those out-of-district tuition placements and other pre-buy that we do for the usual standard supplies and materials that we borrowed against the previous year. That adds up to $16 million. If you look at those pages after it, and a lot of this I've touched on at this point, um, I will remind you that we've had level funding for the third year in a row under aid that we get from the state in Chapter 70. That is truly a reduction in aid when you look at Brockton. We anticipate a, an average of about 2% increase each year. Had we gotten that from the state, and they like to talk in generalities as far as um, the, the inflation rates and the monies that they give to Chapter 70, we would have gotten over 10 million over the past three years if we weren't so-called level funded. We actually had 214 new students in 2016-17. Had we been able to, and this is being counted against our aid that we're getting, I believe, with our direct certification where we were held harmless. So were we able to get that additional money, that would have been 2.5%. Until we actually meet that match of close to $6 million, we will not see additional aid uh, at this time. And again, we continue to work diligently to find a new method um, to end this, what we're calling inequality. The charter schools, I've just talked again about that. I, I'm not gonna walk you through that. I think I've talked quite a bit about it. As far as advocacy goes, you've heard us talk about, and I'm just gonna go over with everybody listening. We have spoken to the Department of Secondary and Elementary Education well over a year ago when this problem began to happen. The mayor has met with Governor Charlie Baker as recently as last week when he came to uh, dedicate the new district attorney federal office on Main Street. We have met in February with the Speaker of the House, Robert DeLeo. We have had in district the Deputy Commission of Desi, Jeff Wolfson, talking about our plight. A week and a half ago, myself and Aldo met with Senator Sal Domenico and our own Senator Mike Brady. He is Vice Chair uh, Senator Domenico of the Senate Ways and Means Committee talking about our concern about our reimbursement, which for the first year when a charter is in your district, you get 100% of that money that would have left with the students. The state hasn't fully funded that. But as far as that 100%, we are asking for it for a second year because of the uncertainty of what we dealt with as a district with a charter last year and really unable to make any adjustments um, in our um, district budget. We met with st uh, State Auditor Suzanne Bump, who heard us loud and clear about an additional measure under direct certification in order to count those students that are not being counted other than those four areas that directly certify them. There's a lot of concerns about that method of calculation. There's an economically disadvantaged problem solving group. Aldo is our member that works with districts from all over, a lot of gateway city districts dealing with some of the same difficulty we are. We had a breakfast with our Brockton area legislative delegation. I wanna thank them for continuing to advocate at every level as this budget goes through the House, the Senate, into conference, and finally, probably sometime this summer, coming out with the budget. Mayor Carpenter, as we speak, is in Washington, D.C. He continues to meet with Congressman Stephen Lynch, who we're providing information to about what I'm sharing with you this evening. We are going to bring, and you'll hear me talk a little bit tonight about our, not just our Brockton Kids Count, but our Save Our Schools. Today I had an opportunity to speak to a local businessman looking to help us fund our advocacy campaign. And when I say fund, I'm talking money for the, for the signs, to really get our word out there so elected officials and our people that live in this city and want more for their children. I need people to want to be advocates for the children in our city. So we're continuing to go out there. I have a list of uh, businessmen in our city that I'm going to be asking for that support as we bring together our parents and our community to continue to advocate for our kids. That we're gonna be having a showcase actually on May 30th up at Brockton <coughs> High School from six to 8 p.m. And Mr. Minicello will not leave me alone unless we talk about the State House and bringing groups of our constituents to the State House and sharing our message on a statewide level. Again, some expected increases that we have as we're trying to level fund or balance the budget. When you build a budget, you take a look at your FY17 budget you, and you talk about level services, having the same services that you had the previous year, but you have to add in collective bargaining increase 
statutory or contract or service increases. Businesses don't say, stay stagnant, whether it's the buses, and I know that's not net school spending, or the contracts we have for technology, or heating, or cooling, or whatever it is, there's an increase just as each one of you faces in your own homes, and everybody out there. Um, we talked about the union increases already. We talked about the health insurance. I think I went, I went over all of those increases. We talked about the employee health insurance, and we talked about replenishing the out of district expenses. So that is my update. There are sheets that we will be sharing with our community when people are asking and asking you, where does this deficit come from? It's a very complicated situation, and we've been working on this for, for well over a year. I don't see Jay Condon in the audience at this point. Is he here? Oh, Mr. Condon, I didn't see you. Right in front of you. Yeah. So I am going to finish up. I just want, I'm going to invite Mr. Condon to please come down and to talk to us. Um, but before we do, because we are going to be running into a time crunch, I will finish up this evening by going over with you, which has been put in front of you, our district organizational chart as it stands. When you're looking at it this evening, I want you to make note of a couple of things. I want you to take a look. If you see a coding in a red, that means that is a job that is remained do not fill at this point. It either has been eliminated in this round of reduction in force or it has been in previous reduction in force the past couple of years. If you see a blue bar over a job title, that is somebody that has in front of them at this time the so-called pink or blue slip that tells them their job right now is not funded for the next school year until we have a better handle on our budget. That was something we talked about at a retreat in January. That is something that I followed through with until we can actually, and I'm going to say it again, we need to balance our budget so that we are allowed to run a district operation and make no mistake about it. When you look at businesses, you can take, somebody gave me this analogy and I really liked it. When you look at you know, GM building a car, the most important thing is the assembly line. When that car comes out, it needs to have tires. It needs to have what it needs before you, the consumer, buy it. That's the product that comes out. But before the product comes out, you need to have a level of district leadership that is talking about innovation, that is looking at you know, how you actually run a business so it is effective in all ways. And although we are going to have to make really difficult choices, I'm going to caution you that we have to be very, very careful to make sure mandates from the state, make sure that we are able to respond as we've always been able to do as a district to take care of those things that I probably won't get to this evening. You would ask for job descriptions and I thank you for asking for those. I'm hopeful that at some point within the next week I'm able to actually sit and focus and have discussion. So before we make decisions, we're making good decisions for our district and decisions based on knowledge and information and questions as to how we go forward as a district and continue to try to find that balance. You're also going to, um, we talked about priority callbacks. Mr. Petronio has passed you out a sheet. At this point in time, the only priorities are your classroom teachers. It wasn't worth it to prioritize any other program, any other supply, material, um, computer program, none of that at this point until we can get a better handle on our classroom teachers being brought back. So you'll see that you've got your list of all of your reductions and you'll see your full-time equivalent and I am talking classroom teachers are our priority at this point. So um, I don't know how much time I'll have to, to get to other things but I do want to invite Mr. Condon to update a little bit about their budget process in the city. Okay, uh, thank you, Superintendent uh, Smith. Uh, I don't have a new number for the school committee other than the one that Aldo has been working with, and I have to be frank, I don't think there's a high likelihood that there will be much increase above the $161 million that you've been working with. Uh, we may be a little bit more, but I really don't think so. What the city is facing on its side is uh, basically, aside from the Chapter 70 funding, the additional assistance we get from the state is up about $800,000. Uh, the two and a half increase is worth about uh, three million dollars and we're estimating new growth this year from uh, uh, taxation growth but not two and a half uh, you know uh, new investment in the city of about a million eight so between all of those things what's that up to about five million dollars our pension is up about six million dollars so it's totally 
all that revenue increase is totally exhausted by the pension increase. You've probably read some stories about it being a little bit over $4 million. That's the amount that it's up beyond what was in the schedule that we expected, but the actual dollar increase we've got to finance from one year to the next is about $6 million. It's a $25 million number. Doesn't count your teachers or your certified staff, but everybody else who works for the city who's in the pension system, including uh, school department employees who aren't certified employees, are paid out of that pension assessment. Their future retirement benefits are paid for. So the mayor's in a bit of a bind. Uh, you mentioned a perfect storm a few minutes ago, and all of this is coming together at, at the wrong time for all of us. So I can't be hi highly encouraging on what we can see for additional assistance from the school department, unless, and I don't expect it, but unless there's a significant amount of increase coming out of the, uh, out of the state in the final budget. But we all know from the newspaper stories that they are seeing difficult revenue times at the state level. The revenues aren't coming in as they were hoping. And we have a, a pretty significant anti-tax uh, increase uh, sentiment up on Beacon Hill. That may change, but at the moment it looks like it would be difficult to get a lot of additional revenue from tax increases. So we're stuck with what we've got and somehow we have to live uh, and manage within that. The consequence is the kind of newspaper stories you've seen, um, and because of the fiscal circumstances you're facing, that are getting play all around the country, not just here in Brockton, of all of these layoffs, including certified staff. And I know whether you're at the end of the day you think there'll be 140 or 150 of real layoffs as opposed to the pink slips, that's too many. But the revenues only stretch so far, and that's the problem we're facing. I share uh, your sentiments. I don't object to anybody in the Brockton School Department to earn the salary they're earning. I think if you look at the jobs that they have to do, um, they're difficult jobs. It's a different job to teach a student in Brockton than it is to teach a student in Lexington or Newton. They're a very different population. So I, I, I just don't, I don't object to those pay increases being granted because you've got to pay them. I will say, I think uh, that uh, Aldo provided to you, Superintendent Smith, a report that came out of Rutgers University. And I'll just summarize it really briefly. Uh, the Graduate School of Education at Rutgers University looked at spending across the entire country on school systems. And they used two measures to try to determine which districts were inadequately funded by the combination of state and local resources. The first was, is a district First of all, it had to be a large enough district, over three or 4,000 students, but if they met that qualification, is the district's average pupil cost in terms of revenue support from state and local sources, not federal, state and local sources, less than 90% of the state average? Brockton is 83%, I think, or 82% of the state average, so we met that qualification. Second qualification to get in this report, you had to show that your poverty level was at least 120% of the state average. Brockton's 140%, so we met that qualification. In all of Massachusetts, there were two districts that fell into this report, Brockton and Lowell. So something is going wrong in how Massachusetts, which has, for the Maine, a more progressive and rational school funding mechanism than most states. But it's broken down badly in Brockton. I think we know what's going on there. I think that the charter school movement has disproportionately affected the more uh, poor communities and especially badly affected Brockton. Uh, you know that uh, we're, you just mentioned, we're spending over $12 million this year that looks like Brockton money. But it never comes to you. It goes to those charter schools or cho school choice. $12 million out of your $170 million Chapter 70 allotment. That's a lot of money. The state is supposed to reimburse you on those costs for a schedule 100% after the first year, 25% after that. They're $2 million short. $2 million. So had you been getting an increase in your Chapter 70 just for inflation or student growth, or had you been getting the $2 million that you're supposed to get from the state, then you'd be in a much different position. And we're bound up at the city level trying to get you extra money. We have our own contracts to settle. Our public safety unions are without contract at the moment. Their contracts expired June 30 a year ago. So if we settle with them, I'm going to owe them for fiscal 17, which is just about to end, and fiscal 18. The other unions are settled, but those costs are coming into <coughs> fiscal 18. So we just don't have the ability to help. I think, and I have thought for a long time, and I've mentioned this in almost every borrowing authorization that the city has asked for, whether it's for school projects or for city projects, the city makes a mistake when it takes on these capital spending projects and doesn't ask the voters to participate for their share. And in the most part, those are modest shares. We're getting 80%, 90%, 
help from the state. And on city projects, we're getting a significant amount of help too. But we don't ask the voters to share in the other part of the cost. If we had and put those costs outside of the two and a half limitation and had it paid directly while the bonds were outstanding, just on the school projects, you'd have another couple million dollars this year. And the voters could know it wasn't going to be permanently into the budget, it would go away as the bonds were paid off. I think we need that kind of help with the kind of problem we're facing this year. I don't think it's right to simply say we're going to live with this kind of uh, deficit, we're going to live with this impact. I think we need to look at what can be done if we are unable to get additional assistance from other, other revenue sources. We ought to look at what can we do to help this by asking the voters to help on their own. They may not, but I think it at least deserves the question to be asked. I don't know, I haven't mentioned this to the mayor, I know he won't like it, he's not a good big tax guy, city council doesn't like to hear it because they've been willing to do it, they'd have done it when those bonds were authorized, but I don't think 150 or 140 or 160 teacher layoffs is an acceptable outcome. I wish I could give you more information that was helpful, but that's that's basically the, the, the nutshell of what we're facing on our side. Mentioning when you say, and you and I have had numerous conversations about this, you're talking about a, a city like Brockton looking at an override or a debt exclusion? Yes. Yes. I, th I think it, it, it is important for the school committee to consider it and re consider requesting it and for the city council to consider it because that level of reduction in basic city services and school funding is a basic city services, just as police and fire are. You, you, you can't have a good, healthy community if you put those kinds of uh, services at risk. We need to figure out whether we should or shouldn't ask the voters. I think we should, and I would advocate to the voters that they consider it. The amount you just on the school projects is not an awful lot of money. It would be uh, like a 2% increase in the taxes for this year, and it wouldn't be permanent. It would go away. That's, that's my thought. At this point, you made a comment about the 2.5%. Um, that's $3 million. Yes. So the mayor is committed, and he has had this conversation with me but we're saying that that money is going to go towards a deficit that the city is facing yes. at this point yeah. with the pension. Yes, yes, you're, you're, I, I don't see an additional increase in, in, in your budget beyond the 161 million because he's got these deficits to close on the other side and um, I haven't finally reviewed all the budget numbers with him so I don't know what his final decision will be. Well, I know I've been asked about tax increase and I can't support any increase uh, two and a half percent increase if we're not going to see any of it. Um, so I think that this is setting us up for quite a division between the two bodies. Um, voters come to us for our opinions on what's going on on that side too. So um, I don't I, understand. I think I do, you I don't, said I don't the, the entire, if there's a, a two and a half increase in taxes. No, that's not what I said. What I said was that with respect to the tax dollars, they all go into a pot and then yeah. they, get, they, get, they get divvied up. Mm -hmm. So I don't think you can say you're not seeing any of that two and a half increase. The mayor might have decided not to fully fund that $161 million because that money is in the pot which is supporting all of this. Mm -hmm. The tax increase I was talking about beyond that was the need for an override. But I don't think it's a fair statement or an accurate statement to say that you're not getting the benefit of the in increase in taxes at all. That's not a fair statement. Well, the, what I got from it was you said we were at 161 and if there's a two and a half percent increase, no. most of it would be eaten up by the... No, I'm, what I'm saying is the budget is balanced with that two and a half in there, including giving you 161 million. It. Yes, okay. and, and that 161 is above probably the amount that you would be required to get from the city under the net school spending law. So much of that money is going away from the school appropriation into other costs, charter school, health right. insurance, retiree health insurance. So you're but you're, ben you're benefiting from it. I misstated if that was okay. the impression you got. Yeah, I think that other people okay. understood it that way. Okay. I've spoken to several constituents who say they are here in our city because of our schools. What do you say to them? If, if this is the budget that we're yeah. dealing with, what's the response to these people? How do we show them that we care about our schools and we're going to fund them properly? Well, I, what I would say to them is what I just said. 
I don't think that the budget with that level of layoffs is an acceptable budget. But the amount of money that's available to support all city services is what it is. And I don't think it's a fair request to say we don't want to increase the salaries of city employees while we're increasing the salaries of school employees. They're all deserving of increases. Nor do I feel, think it's an appropriate response to say, under the formula that determines how much we're supposed to provide to the schools, we're going to exceed it. And then we're going to go even more above that in order to reduce spending on pu public safety uh, staff in order to accomplish that. It's the city is um, it's important to review to, to view it I think as a whole, an integral whole. And schools are as important as the public safety, but it's the same the other way. If you don't have good public safety, you won't have people living here either. I think the school system is deserving of more money, but I think the problem is how we're being funded at the state level, not whether the city is meeting its obligation. I think that's the problem. So the pressure ought to be directed to Beacon Hill, I think, because that's where we're not getting the appropriate support. But I don't think it's appropriate to say we ought to just fire 178, 179 teachers. That's not a good outcome. I don't support that. We just have to do what we have to do to make the budget work. That's my answer to them. Uh, just out of curiosity, the two and a half increase that's already in the, the city budget, do you have a, an idea about what the average tax bill increase the average resident could expect? Uh, for a two and a half percent increase, the average bill is, I think, just under $4,000. Okay. So, you know, it's, what's that, 80 bucks, 90 dollars? Okay. Yeah. Right. A year, I mean, that's not. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. it's 4,000 a year. There are, I think, 350 communities in Massachusetts which are tracked by the, the state as, you know, tax levying communities. I think the average tax bill in Brockton is like fourth from the bottom. Fourth from the bottom. So, 340 something tax higher on average in terms of average bill than Brockton. That's a combination of the rate and the, uh, and the values of properties. Okay. Thank you. If you were fully, you know, you're allowed to tax at two and a half percent of a of state value, but you're capped as to how much you can go up toward that every year. Mm -hmm. But Brockton has probably 35 or 40 million dollars worth of override capacity annually uh, under mm -hmm. the state tax law. You have to have the voters' permission. I'm not advocating for a 30, 40 million dollar tax increase, but I think a couple million dollars might help, and I do think that's important. Okay. So. Yeah, you used that number of 350 and this is, again, a poor city, when you look at those districts that go above and beyond once they meet foundation, we are second from the bottom. And I think the two are related. Uh, well, absolutely, but that's what I'm saying. Out of all of those districts, we do not get there. Are some districts that, again, once you meet foundation, whatever your foundation formula is, and just to explain that, and these are figures mm -hmm. that are not completely accurate, as we just found out, it's about it's about an 80-20 split. Right. Little by little, the city is getting wealthier. I'll never use that word, but I guess I can use it there. At 78% um, that the state has to give us, and the district is actually up to 22% instead of the 20%. Right, and it's, expect, it's expected to go another percent or two in order to meet its obligation which over is, time. Which is the city moving in the right direction. Correct. The only problem with that is when you hear me talk about 350, 351 districts, once districts meet that foundation, and I always talk about a wealthier community where maybe they put in 80% of their tax dollar and the state gives them 20%. They then go above and beyond foundation. They want technology, they want one-to-one -one devices, they want, you know, whatever. You see them giving additional dollars. And that is the inequity and that is what brought about your McDuffie case back in the early 90s when Brockton could not keep up with the surrounding towns and the class sizes were large and they really didn't have the materials, the supplies, et cetera. So we've talked about it before also with Mr. Condon here and, and the mayor. We have had conversations. I believe all of us are waiting for the state budget to settle. We've had conversations with other districts and we are clearly starting to move in that direction also, you know, to talk about you know, what we need as a city to, you know, properly fund our educational system. And the problem that I think the state has, and people haven't really <laughs> talked about it enough, we've been very focused on 16 million. But I want to remind everybody out there that the Brockton Public Schools, and we just got a note today from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, and they continue to talk about Massachusetts being number one. You had the commissioner sitting here in September, and that's what he shared with you, is the, and we're thrilled about that. That's the good news for our state. But I want to remind everybody that Brockton as a gateway city is one of the reasons why you are number one as far as your achievement goes. You again have level one high school. 
Your middle schools are level one and two for the most part. Your elementary schools are level three, one, and two. We do not have level four or level five. And when the kids stay with us longer, your elementary schools certainly set the stage for those students to start to achieve when they get into the middle and the high school. You have large numbers of kids that are graduating, lower numbers that are dropping out because you have put into place alternative settings for our students. You've done all of these things. You had people out here a week and a half ago from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education at Brockton High School viewing the practices of an urban 4,300 student level one high school so they can share those best practices with so-called turnaround schools or schools that are having difficulty meeting their accountability standards. So again, when we talk about equity in education, Brockton should be the lead plaintiff. Because at this point, when you talk about dismantling a school district, on the backs of our teachers, on the backs of what our constituents and our families expect, I don't know how we've hung on this long, and it really has been smoke and mirrors, and we've held on to your sports, you've held on to your arts, you've held on to so many things that you still allow the children in our district to get. So, you know, at this point, you know, we're all working together. It's just very frustrating. And what we need are more people to come together and join us and talk about what they can do to assist us in, in moving forward from here. Mr. Conner, do you anticipate any layoffs on the city side this um, cycle? I don't, think, I don't think there will be any on the city side, no. Um, I hope not. Is, um, if the city participated in the GIC as opposed to the current mm -hmm. system with regard to health insurance, would, the, would we realize any savings? Yes, uh, we, four years ago, uh, the city's mayor at the time proposed that the city, we, wouldn't, we weren't eligible to join the GIC, we were eligible to adopt GIC-like plans, and that was proposed. Uh, but the proposal didn't get through the city council. There was a significant amount of opposition to the proposal from the city's unions, and the city council said, no, uh, go back and bargain something with your unions, and we did. And when we bargained with the unions, we got a significant amount of savings and created this uh, four-year public employee committee that governed our health insurance from that time on. And that uh, resulted in what was probably two and a half million dollars worth of savings then, but it could have been, I think, about four or five million if we'd gone the other route. But nonetheless, we, we bargained it. When that agreement came, I uh, was coming to an end in, at the end of this June. We met with the Public Employee Committee again, said that we had a couple of options. Uh, one was to look to extend it. And the second was to uh, simply attempt again to the city council to see if they would allow us to go to GIC-like plans. We bargained again with the uh, Public Employee Committee, and as a result of that, they accepted additional reductions in their benefits, which saved the city some more money, I think about $2.5 million, including the, the school piece of that. But had we gone to the GIC, the deductibles and the co-pays would have been higher and the savings would have been greater. Nonetheless, it was a bargain approach. So if we, so if we had made that decision back a few years back, you think this year there would be approximately two to three million dollars less of an expense to uh, yeah I think that's probably a good estimate okay yeah. um, and um, with respect to um, uh, I guess potential options um, can, is there a uh, a look back um, mechanism that is a um, an, basically an option that um, could be pursued uh, with respect to prior years uh, where there wasn't a tax increase. You mean you can only level each each year within the, pro, the, the confines of the Prop 2.5 law, so I don't think you can go back and get a, an additional. If there was levy left on the table. Right, that's what I'm, that, that yes. yeah. Could you explain well, that? Yes, you're, you're always able to go up to each year's levy limit without voter approval, and uh, that's basically the prior year levy limit plus 2.5% plus new growth. So if in the prior levy limit there were monies that weren't appropriated, that money is available for the next year. What you never get is the ability to go back and levy that money for the year it was gone. And so if we've got several years, and we did, where we didn't use the full levy, had we levied it, let's say just put it into the stabilization fund and not spend it, just put it aside for a rainy day, we'd have had another $8 million or $9 million that would have been in that fund that isn't in there. So if, if that mechanism was, was pursued, what, um, what could be realized from that 
Well, what's uh, what's available that hasn't been levied? Correct. From last year was about three million dollars. So a total of three million. Yeah, from last year that wasn't levied. Yes. Okay. Oh, okay. We're short on time. Um, anyone else? Very quickly, Mark, be very quick, please. How much money is currently in the stabilization fund? Uh, about five and a half million. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Great. Okay. Um, as usual, Mr. Condon, you are always are very um, beneficial to uh, the committee in terms of providing us with accurate financial information, and we Thank certainly you. appreciate um, you. You're always willing to come and speak to us, and you're always willing to, um, you know, contribute to our dilemma. Um, so um, we really uh, do appreciate your consideration and okay. your um, participation. And if I could make one clarifying comment with respect to the money that was in the levy that hasn't been used in the past when I said I didn't anticipate layoffs in the city side, it depends largely on what decision that the mayor makes with respect to that unused levy capacity because if he decides not to use it, there will be really deep layoffs in the city side. Okay. We appreciate you. Thank you. Um, I think we need to. Um, I think we need to wrap up and adjourn so that we can. Uh, Correct. So. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Mr. Conan. So is school choice under Great. finance? Um, so we have to end finance. Yeah. So um, can I have someone make a motion to adjourn finance? Motion to adjourn finance. Second. All right, all in favor? Thank you. Okay. The next item on our agenda tonight is school choice. And um, we do have a um, sign-in sheet if anyone wanted to sign in and speak on it. So I'll basically invite people one last time. Okay, I don't see anyone volunteering to speak on school choice. Okay. So um, with respect to school choice, the Brockton Public Schools uh, participates in this program where we uh, allow a, a certain number of students from different communities um, to attend some of the um, programs that we have here in Brockton. Um, and um, on many occasions, um, it's a very, well on most occasions, it's a very positive experience for um, these students and it also, I think, um, highlights all of the good things that are going on in Brockton and basically, in my opinion, spreads the word throughout some of these other uh, smaller towns and suburbans um, and, and basically illustrates that, you know, we have a lot to offer and, and there are programs here that are so unique um, that, um, you know, only Brockton can, can offer them. Uh, point in fact, um, was the musical this, this weekend. I mean, there's no other, I think, um, district that can put on a musical um, to that extent. I, I just um, think there are many students that pursue Brockton because of the different programs with regard to the arts, with regard to academics, with regard to, uh, you know, a, a host of different types of um, issues. So, um, that being said, with regard to the public hearing on school choice, um, we will call this meeting to order and I will now read the statutory requirement um, required language. So, good evening and welcome to the public hearing on school choice. Chapter 76, section 12B of the, M of the MGL, Massachusetts General Laws, as amended by the Education Reform Act of 1993 and subsequent legislation provides for statewide school choice programs. The law requires each school committee in the state to admit students from other districts under the school choice program unless there is a vote to withdraw from the program by June 1st of each year. Prior to such vote, there must be a public hearing on the issue of whether or not to participate in school choice. Um, I will now officially open the hearing, um, call on those who um, signed up on the visitor sheet, which to my knowledge is no one at this point. Um, there being no further visitors or anyone wishing to speak um, with respect to school choice, I will then um, call for a motion to close the hearing. Motion to close the hearing on school choice. Second. Okay. Um, 
would anyone on the committee like to address the issue or speak on the issue? Ms. Plant. Do we feel that with the budget that we're going to be dealing with next year, is this still going to be a beneficial way to move forward? Well, I, I, I th guess that's a, a question for the superintendent in terms of the numbers, whether the number of students um, would be um, such that the system um, cannot handle them. Would you like to discuss that? I, I will that? address it. Um, it's one of those things, and you heard Mr. Minicello talk to us about our district. Um, but in, in light of our deficit, um, and you're probably not going to find this makes sense, but I do feel that we have control. I do feel we should open it up, you know, at our high school level, which we always had, and especially at our Edison High School, which we have an evening school, not many of the surrounding towns have. Um, we're able to staff that depending on the numbers. So I'd like to make sure there is no cap on our evening program. If there were students from Easton or the Bridgewaters that would like to come to our evening program as far as our Edison Academy at night, that should be open to anyone that wants to come. Remember, those are counts as of October 1st that's Chapter 70 funding for us. I think we continue with our high school, and one of the things we have not done because of our numbers is opened up our middle school. Whether you do it this year or next year, as you start to lose to charter, I think you start to market yourself and you compete. There are a number of uh, families. Again, you've continued to have IB. I know you're looking at it with a task force next year. You continue to offer things that there are many high schools that they do not offer. Obviously, our students are our first priority. And with our budget as tight as it is, we want to make sure that we have class sizes that are appropriate. But by voting, it doesn't mean that you have to accept them. So I would say that you should vote in school choice. You've always done the high school. I think you should keep it open-ended as far as your Edison Academy program in the evening. And it would be up to you if you want to wait a year in the middle school. Um, we have not done middle or elementary school at this point. Well, to ask it really more directly would be, do you think we will lose more students considering um, what we're dealing with? It's been painted all over the media, our losses. Do you, do you project we're going to lose more students than we actually may gain? We have lost, uh, you heard the numbers uh, at the area charter school. You know, one was unusual. You had the opening of a charter. So that's the first time any of us have experienced that. Um, the 90 students, they, they were given additional seat capacity at both, both Foxborough and South Shore Charter. They do not have, they're probably at their limit. They do not have seat capacity going into the next year. So I don't anticipate, and remember though, you do have um, a charter school opening up, I think, a grade nine. So you could lose at your high school level and you do accept high school students under your previous school choice. So I can't give you an accurate number at this point. Well, I think, I think this year will be kind of telltale for us. Okay. Thank you. Uh, this having school choice when students come in from other districts, I assume that brings dollars in. Is that? Uh, it does. It's, it's, a little bit, it's a little bit different. When you heard me talk about charter and the $11,000 charter figure going with the student, when you do school choice, which is why whether our students go to a West Bridgewater or an East Bridgewater, that is $5,000 that the, that the uh, community receives, the receiving community. And that's basically fair. And, and the way your surrounding towns make no mistake about it, they have an opportunity because they can strategically, and I've described this as a first grade with a town having 15 first graders in a class and knowing that it's difficult for them to support a teacher with maybe 15 students. So they strategically say, we will open up in grade one five more seats. Well, five more seats gives them $25,000. So that certainly helps towards funding that teacher. That becomes a bonus, which is why you've seen your area towns look at it strategically. Okay. So it's $5,000 when you're talking school choice versus charter loss. Okay. Correct. Thank you. Now, and so maybe that offsets some of, the, of what's going because we're losing to the charter and others. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, this is kind of a, probably a tough thing for you to answer, but is that 5,000 enough based on, you know, you said the kinds of students, we have some students cost more to educate, some students cost mm -hmm. less, right? Is that, oh, is this costing us money? 
basically. It's presently not costing us money. Okay, so it's not hurting us. Correct. Financially, okay. You just, you basically hit the nail on the head. Some of the, it basically is an offset. It offsets some of the loss that we incurred due to students leaving. And the superintendent's absolutely right. Don't think that West Bridgewater and East Bridgewater didn't anticipate when they built those high schools, you know, some kids coming from another community like Brockton. East Bridgewater is a middle and high school. They, they're not only a high school, That's, that facility is middle school and high school because they couldn't support just a new high school. So, you know, I, you know, I always have looked at it as a positive, as a, you know, as, as a win-win for Brockton. It spreads the word in terms of all the good things that we have here. Um, you know, the programs, the, the, the staff that we have, um, and it also, you know, again, offsets some of that loss of revenue. But I understand, you know, Ms. Plant's comment. So it's basically, you know, we shall see what the outcome is based on how this budget forms. So, so anyone else? Okay, seeing none. Do you want me to just give you, so Aldo just handed me the figures. So, so school choice coming in this past year, you had 38 students come in at the very, your high school, your Edison, and you had 267 students leave under school choice. That is not your charter. That is your school choice. Um, all right, we do not take a vote at this time. This was simply the um, hearing uh, of visitors with respect to school choice. So there is a motion to adjourn on the table. Um, we will take the vote, the official vote, at the regular um, school committee meeting when basically we report in what happened here at this, at this um, point in, in the meeting. Um, so uh, no, any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor to close the hearing. Okay, wonderful. So. Please um, take their seats. We're going, we are going to start. Okay, thank you for attending tonight's meeting. Um, why don't we have some of the students find a seat. Yeah. Okay. Could everyone please join me in saluting the flag? I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Thank you for attending. Um, if you were here for finance, the superintendent informed everyone that the mayor is advocating for the city down in Washington, so that's why he's not here. Um, second item on our agenda is the hearing of visitors. No one has signed up, so we will move on to the consent agenda. The consent agenda is the bundling of some of the routine matters of the school committee, and at this point in time, um, it's an opportunity for any individual member to remove a, a specific item for further discussion. So, that being said, does anyone want to remove a particular item for further discussion? Um, item A, please. Item A. Okay, item A. Anything else? Okay, so, um, can someone make a motion to approve B, C, D, E, F, G, and H? Mark. <laughs> the consent agenda and agenda items B, C, D, E, F, G, and H. Okay. A second, please. Second. Thank you, Mr. Sullivan. Any further discussion? <coughs> okay. All in favor? Wonderful. All right. Ms. Plant on item A. I'd like to um, have a correction be made to the minutes okay. in regards. Sorry, I have to find the page now. Um, the very last page of our meeting minutes. Page six. Okay. In regards to the vote to um, add two half days to the end of the school year, the vote should read um, vote to approve five to two. I also proposed that vote. Okay. Th that's fine. Um, 
we will make that notation and uh, correct the minutes. Um, I don't believe we need a, we, uh, that's just a, um, that's just a typo correct basically. Yeah, we, we don't need a vote on that. But okay. okay, so we will correct that item. All right. Um, with that correction, is there anything else in the minutes, Ms. Plant, that you'd like to change? No, that's it. Thank you very much. Can you then make a motion to approve that with the correction? I make motion to accept item A, um, the meeting minutes of our last meeting, um, with the change made on the vote to approve the motion, five to do, five to two, with Ms. Plant and Mr. Gormley opposed. Okay. Second, anyone? Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, communication. Report of the Superintendent of Schools. Yes. Um, again, with everything that we're dealing with, it's always a pleasure to have some good news to celebrate. And one of those uh, items that we continue to celebrate um, is our Empower Yourself recognition. And I'm always amazed because I think back to coming on board as superintendent in 2013. And one of the first things I heard about was this new program coming on board, what we were able to do with young people at a few of our schools, and it really has just blossomed. And many of you, even this past week, uh, Mr. Turner, Cedric Turner, who oversees the program, continues to update us about these wonderful students that truly understand the world of finance, that understand um, appropriate use of uh, stocks and exchanges and all of those wonderful things. They talk about, they have TV, or excuse me, radio stations where they talk to other students about college debt or scholarship or a way to fund education. So very, very practical things. I'm pleased this past year that um, I got a note and I went back to September to look at the uh, email from Mr. Turner about taking over, over 45 of our young girls to the Red Sox training camp, the Ron Burton training camp, which I actually had the opportunity to go to in the fall, I think, of 2014. Just a great opportunity for these students. So I know, Mr. Minicello, you were instrumental in wanting to recognize and have Mr. Turner come with his team of students to talk to us about the Empower Yourself program. Let me just say a couple of things. Um, Mr. Turner is tremendous with respect to financial literacy. and. Um, um, he motivates his students. His students are so bright, and they are such a um, wonderful example of, you know, Brockton's finest. And um, I think that Mr. Turner really gets the best out of these students. Uh, he respects them, and I can see that they respect him. Um, just a, a funny story. He invited me to attend Bentley College. Uh, Mr. Turner has some wonderful contacts all over the state with um, very important people and influential people. And he has great contacts with Bent people at Bentley College who are very impressed with our students. So it's not going to surprise me that a number of his students get approved and um, accepted to Bentley. But they have a, um, a, a, stock, um, a stock trading room at Bentley. It's very rare. Um, it may be one of the only schools in, in the country that has a, a, a New York Stock Exchange stock trading room. So, they went there to basically participate in in a um, in in a game, but you know basically a real life game where you're provided with a number of um, an, an amount of money and different choices with stocks, and basically you you know, can either lose or or, or win and um, succeed. So he says to me, "Why don't you play with the kids?" So I I said, "All right, I'll I'll play the game." So I'm playing the game and. I'm like, wow, you're good, Tom. You just doubled your money at the end of the um, exercise. So then, then the scores come up on the screen. And um, I'm looking, I'm saying, doubled my money? These kids tripled it and quadrupled it. I'm like, what a bum I am. Um, and what was amazing, uh, for the first time, according to the professor that was in charge, is that um, our winner, um, the top three winners were females. And, you know, so it was very impressive. So um, some of us gentlemen had to basically eat humble pie. But I ate a big piece of humble pie because, again, I thought I was so good. And turns out that uh, these kids blew me away big time. Um, but um, Mr. Turner really is the best. Um, he is so energetic. Um, he is so giving of himself. 
and I'm just so impressed with the quality of student that he basically, um, he, he brings the best out in kids. So I'd love to introduce Mr. Cedric Turner, and I'd like everyone to give him a big round of applause. Absolutely. Yeah, Mr. Turner. Please. Yeah, could you please say a few words, and then I'd love you to introduce your students. And if they'd like to say a few words, that would be great as well. Uh, okay. Well, the in fact, it was very type of was the first thing you kind of was it was it left out. We are the brand brand new, uh, in fact, you know, state champion. In fact, you know, in fact, state 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 champion stock stock pitch the type of competition. So we had it won uh, this year past Thursday. Uh, we was with some schools that was, you know, with you, uh, in fact, you know, prep schools, with private schools. Uh, the competition was out at King, in fact, King, in fact, Phillips High School. Uh, we had ourselves with you. Judges there that came from the, what, the Netherlands, that came from what, Japan, was it New York, uh, and I and was it, we had we we had in fact was was it one, so now we are inside the state was won it, and now we're, we're on to the what's the nationals, which is inside of what's the Los Angeles, uh, Mr. Uh, what's it, in fact what's the Cuban Mike in fact was the Cuban up the what's the Mavericks will be one of the the in fact what's it in fact was the judges and if that was we up there win which I kind of think that we will uh, not only do, was, do I kids have themselves with the money but they had told me that the type of the if at the school that he comes from gets a large 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 was it some they didn't have me told was it what it was but it's all inside of the the uh, what's it the rules um, so, you know, I am extremely proud of them. It was hard, hard fought. Uh, we had to learn, well, not we, they had to learn all of these terms. They had to learn about what's the margin, margin effect, what's your calls. They had to learn about all the, the intricacies of what's it stocks, bonds, UI, UITs. So all the things we had learned over the years, going to what did the, what's the Bentley College, going to for, type of with fidelity for all these years and the kids kind of was re retained it and so what our type of thing is we have them inside the what's middle middle school so we have a lot of our kids here inside the middle middle school here now uh, and we have them kept throughout the high school uh, and our type of program has just grown and grown and grown and grown so we get which more and more kids uh, we had to have a conversation with you about our type of space because we didn't have enough type of space for our, t our type of kids. So it has been great. But, you know, on the other side, what, did, what we have to kind of do is we have them gave us the access. A lot of our, a lot of our kids, they don't have the, the access. The reason that people pay themselves was 50, 50, 50 something thousand dollars to go to school like was it, was it Buckingham, Brown and Nichols and Milton Academy and Thera Academy. It isn't because of their, their type of school is so, so great. It is because of the access. They have was the access to schools. They have the access to uh, what's it, the the institutions, the firms, uh, the, what Bentley's, the Morgan effect, what's it, in fact, what's it, Stanley's. They have access, and so what they, what we have to do is we we have our kids gave that that access. So now we have ourselves with uh, kids who are about to go to. Bentley's effect with camp. Uh, we got with uh, four effect kids who are about to go there this year with the summer, and then they'll be what's walked, what's right into the the effect school. Uh, do we have anyone here from the camp? Uh, yeah, one of our campers is there, uh, and that day was a camp cost two thousand bucks. For us, it's free. All right. When that was, we have the kids taken to the in fact the red, red in fact in fact socks socks camp. This here year we'll we'll have ourselves a, was it, 
uh, West Emma Girls Camp and also a thing of Boys Camp. Each each of those was the weekends is what the forty three was forty three grand. Uh, that was we don't they don't they don't have us build. They don't have us build. They don't have what you guys would build. They just say we'll have it eaten, and they have it done in, t in terms of us every every year. So we are just with building up these relationships. We now have ourselves a wish uh, the engineering um, wish program now a engineering with the aviation program in which some of my kids is going to come up here and have a conversation about the, the engineering we have ourselves uh, preferred type of what we uh, Thursday we will wish to be at with the MIT uh, we will be talking to admissions we have about two or two or if I were three uh, kids who will probably if I were making into it, the MIT was this year. We have ourselves preferred admissions into MIT, into Harvard, uh, the W. Wilson PI, and also to Wilson Bentley. So, you know, this is, this is, I, I mean, I can't be, what's it, was it more so happy. I could not have it done without the wonderful, wonderful sub type of was a supporter of you guys. Uh, Mike, Mike, in fact, was it Thomas over there is was my guy because I always call him Mike, man. I need a bus. I need a bus. <laughs> and he's always on. So I have always received the type of support from my what the principals, the superintendent's office have been been absolutely great. Uh, Mr. Minnicello, I've always invited him to our uh, the the competition. So we we engage inside the the type of competitions with uh with these here schools that's way up there. So all these schools like the Latins the type of East, East type of what's it, in fact, what's it, Greenwich, all of these top, top schools that all the Ivy League schools are after. So we, we will have them engaged in a competition. And you know what? We have to win. And we, we are kind of used to these here kids are now so much used to what's it, winning. So it's not up to ask if no one's there. Oh man, those are what you Brockton, Brockton kids, and you know we can just walk all all over them. That is that is not our type of whistle rep. So um, that is said, I do want to have some of our whistle kids up here uh, who who would like to talk. Uh, okay, Abdul, and who is who is first? Don't everybody raise up their hand at the same time. Abdul, come come, come on up here. <laughs> Uh, good, how are you? Uh, hello, my name is Abdul, and I am from Young Investor Society, Nesby, and Empower Yourself. I am the president of uh, Young Investor Society, which is uh, teamed up with Fidelity. And I am working with uh, Microsoft and all these different major companies that are helping these schools. Like, for example, this summer we're actually planning to rebuild the Yellow IC here, and um, that's our goal. And I'm also working with MIT to create new inventions like the food computer. We'll be mentioned the uh, slides. And uh, online, I actually make $24 million. <laughs> Uh, not in my pocket, but you know, it's uh, online gaming, and I'm one out of 396 students out of the whole U.S. Yeah, I do, yeah. definitely. And um, you, I take it, uh, have participated and gone to places that ordinarily, without the program, you wouldn't be able to attend. Yes, like Bentley. Mm -hmm. That's and cool. also, um, were you there the day I was there? Uh, no, I don't think All so. All right, well, you probably would have beat me too, but. <laughs> 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 so, well, we appreciate you, and um, we're glad that uh, you're, the program is doing so well for you. Mm -hmm. um, um, is Mr. Turner, is there anyone else that you'd like to have say a, a couple of words? Or? Let's have Gittleson. Mr. Turno, how many how many students would you say right now, you know, overall participate in the program? I have at the high school alone. We we had two of it. I would stop 
because we didn't have room. So we, we had it stopped about what, 38 uh, because we didn't have room in terms of everybody. Uh, we, we, we could probably have a, much, much more if we, we had the, with the space uh, and also help. Um, but we, we had to have it stopped there. In the middle, middle in fact, with the schools, we have about which 20, 20 in fact, which five at North and about which 29 at the Asheville. Okay, wonderful. Good evening, how are you? Good, how are you? Good, can you tell us your name? My name's Ayana. Oh, great, and what school do you go to, Ayana? I go to the Ashfield. Oh, that's my old school. I went there as a child in elementary, so I know it well. So how are you doing tonight? Great. Um, I enjoy Empower Yourself a lot because when I came to the Ashfield as a new middle schooler, I was expecting a challenge, and Mr. Zimbor and Mr. Turner took me under their wing and introduced me to something that I wouldn't have been introduced to without them. I now understand what a stock and a trade is. I was given the opportunity to go to Fidelity and make new friends. I have um, email contacts with multiple um, important officials at Fidelity. I've been offered an internship um, when I turn when I go to high school. So that's like so. Empire stuff has given me a lot of things, and I found a passion in business due to Empire Self. Um, I recently was selling marshmallow pops with the help of my mother to um, raise money for my GSA club at my school. It was really fun to sell them and make them, and my mom helped me understand money even more than I already did. And again, I wouldn't have been given this opportunity or these thoughts without um, Mr. Turner, and now I'm thinking about making this a bigger thing and may, maybe bring it to the Shark Tank. Wonderful. <laughs> Hi, Mom. How are you? Oh, I'm well. And you? I'm great. Oh, it turned on. Would you like to say something? Um, yes. My name is Peggy Lewis, and Ayan is my daughter. Uh, I also have my son here, Quentin, who goes to the baker. Hi, Quentin. Um, and empower yourself. Ayana came home and she started talking about this great program that I had not heard anything about. And her excitement level was so great that I just had to inquire. Um, Mr. Turner has been a beacon with this program. And as Ayana mentioned, um, she, she just has excelled. I, I look at my daughter and she does really well in class. Um, she gets straight A's. She's really outspoken. People say she's a little like me. Um, <laughs> and I take that as a compliment. And I think every parent that has a child has a desire for that child to be successful and to do well. And you look to the school system to be that beacon and to continue to do that. Um, so I think with Empower Yourself, um, Mr. Turner is definitely doing great work. Um, he mentioned some other independent schools um, that shall not be named, but I had looked into two of them, <laughs> only because as a parent, um, I really wanted more for her. I want great things. I want her to be phenomenal. I want her to do well in school. I want her to um, dance on clouds if she so desires and have access to dance on clouds. So um, that's my emotional plea for Empower Yourself. I think it's a great program and as my daughter as an example and as an example to the students that came to speak on the behalf of the program, I think it's one that should be supported greatly. Well, thank, thank you, you very thank much. You for the Yeah, absolutely. So after this, gentlemen, we'll invite the entire group up to take a picture with Mr. Turner when he receives his certificate of appreciation. How are you, young man? I'm good. My name is Gidelson Salami. I've been in this program since about the seventh grade, to be honest. It, without the program, I probably wouldn't probably be the same way I am right now. It gave me access to many things I probably wouldn't have been able to access throughout the years. I'm the president of the Nesby chapter that we have here. NSBE is the National Society of Black Engineers. 
To be honest, Mr. Turner is a guy who tries to help us move forward, try to attain the dreams that we want. I'm someone who wants to do engineering. Um, I probably wouldn't have reached out as much as he did for me to find different way, uh, opportunities for engineering, such as uh, Nesby. Because the group itself it gives you many opportunities through it. You, so we are the first actual chapter in Massachusetts, first Nesby Junior chapter. So that's a great achievement for, for us. One of my things I actually want to do in my life is I leave a leave a mark, which this group this group has really helped me do. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Well, we appreciate. It. Oh yes, and um, I just want to mention that um, on June fifteenth, over at uh, the Massasoit Conference Center, um, at uh, while well, the reception begins at five o'clock and dinner at six. Um, there is an Empower Yourself second annual gala. So, um, if. Oh, wow. Well, sounds I'm good. <laughs> you are now, exactly. Yeah. So, if people would like to uh, get tickets, just let us know and we will um, uh, get you in touch with Mr. Turner and we can arrange for that. Um, it, um, it, uh, I'm sure, is going to be a wonderful evening. Um, and um, will many of the students be there? Well, uh, let me just have you gave some some type of news. So, so I just heard uh, was it this afternoon about some of the type of the co corporations there. Uh, and since that we have with some one, we have gotten reached out by a lot of corporations. One of which is with it, Google will kind of be there. Google will be there. Fun type of what the fidelity will be there. Well, you deal the with corporations mark. that no one's ever heard of, huh? Yeah, I mean, for Dawani. Yeah, I mean, these are, and they love our, in fact, kids. And see, you know, this is the thing. People come into these schools, and they they have all these here pre pre type of conceived things about you know the private private in fact with schools is where th that you go or latin or boston latin who send like with 75 kids to with the ivy league a, a year um and so you know with brockton may just send with one or because well you know they don't really really know and so what did we are doing is we're we are having that whole concept change for for with the everyone so it's not just that are type of kids, uh, because now they have to say it's not just them; it's it is Brockton, um, and that is the the image that we want. That we can head there, and we can get all types of kids, and we can get kids in engineering and economics and architecture, or so whatever. And so that is that is why that reaching out, reaching out to these companies have any type of uh, preferred type of re type of recruitment we have. I mean, we will, uh, next next fall, uh, we have ourselves 19, uh, about 19 with you, with you, in fact, with seniors this year, this year fall. Uh, they will absolutely with a layer the Ivy League. I mean, the all of them, uh, the average type of grade, grade point average of our kids is about 3.8. So our, so our kids do extremely well in the classroom. They also do well with it right outside side of the classroom because one of the things they would like to know is how can you which is basically apply that to type of which knowledge. It's one one thing to have A's on this year this year paper. But but you know now can that you have that did was it done in a competition? Um, and you know we have kind of shown over and over again, yeah, we we if they kind of can. And you know just like you know last year we had beat the what's the national, what's the financial literacy what's the champions what's the three times, and they haven't kind of like lost in years. And they travel all over the nation which was was beating up on people, and they ran in which to us, and they lost they lost with three times was to us so you know so our kids got a lot of confidence uh and I'm very very was proud of of them and last last was Thursday showed just how much type of confidence so we would like to just do it. In fact, we're to build up on this. We like to, in fact, to grow. I think as we're kind of bringing in uh, these here, these here, these here, 
corporations, I would like to see them say, wow, look at how that went to do, which is Brockton, which supports their own, their own kids. Because that's the thing they would like to see. The, you know, so when that you came out the last time, oh wow, man, the super, super which attendant is here. And they like, wow, she actually comes out here and which supports it. And that kind of is, is in their mind and when that, that you came to what to do. Bentley, they're like, wow, he's he's on the infect committee. And that just shows that the whole whole type of town is uh, with, with us. And that's in fact was very, very important. Wonderful. All right, so um, without further ado, Mr. Turner, I'd like to invite you up here and I'd like to have your students come up with you and we'll take a nice picture. Here we go. It's Mr. Turner. Yes, the man of the hour. Here you go. Sophie, come on up. Well, look at these guys, mm -hmm. well dressed. Mm -hmm. I guess I'm going in the front. Thank you very much. Oh, thanks, We're proud of everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You look so handsome. We're proud to see every one of you. These students are fine ambassadors for the city and for our school system. So. Okay, Madam Superintendent. Okay, moving on, another good news story. And I, you know, when we talk about the Brockton Public Schools and we talk about K to 12, sometimes we forget, not that I do, that we have our adult learning center where many of the adults that go there uh, for a variety of opportunities, an opportunity to uh, achieve a high school diploma, an opportunity to continue to learn an English language, an opportunity for citizenship. So many things happen, again, on Crescent Street, there are neighbors down the street, our adult learning center. And I am so proud, and I'm going to invite Kathy Quinn, our coordinator of the adult learning center, to come up here. And I want her to introduce a wonderful student to you, an adult student who is, again, just been named the 2017 Outstanding Student of the Year by the Massachusetts Coalition for Adult Education. It's called MK. And uh, again, I think the story is worth uh, talking about, and I would like to invite down that adult student. It's Cancery Goget. Cancery, please join us, and please give him a round of applause. Welcome. Thank you very much. Kathy Quinn, the director of the Adult Learning Center. I'm very happy to be here tonight to um, introduce you to Cancery Go Get. Cancery has been a student at the Adult Learning Center since 2010. He came here from Haiti after the earthquake. And he started as an ESOL student, um, progressed through learning the English language, um, moved over to our adult education classes, and has so far passed four of the five high set exams, which is quite an accomplishment in seven years. So MK, the Massachusetts Coalition of Adult Educators, each year asks for teachers and directors to recommend an outstanding student. And we didn't have to think very far to come up with Cancery's name. Um, there are many, many things that he has contributed um, to his family life and to the Adult Learning Center. He is a student ambassador for us, which means when students who speak very little English come to register at the Adult Learning Center, he volunteers his time to come in and translate for them and make them feel welcome. 
He is also a member of our advisory board and he shares his insights with us as to how we can improve the program. He is here with his two sons. Right here. <laughs> Noah and Mick, who are students in the Brockton Public Schools. Cancery spends his spare time. He is a musician and an Uber driver. <laughs> and um, also spends time with his boys, taking them to music lessons, supporting their educational endeavors. And um, we were very proud and uh, honored when he was honored Friday um, at a dinner for 500 in Marlboro, sponsored by the Mass Coalition for Adult Educators. So he can tell his story much better than I, and I think I'll turn it over to him. Good evening. My name is Ken, Ken Siri Guget. Uh, that's the American accent, but in French they say Ken Siri. <laughs> yes, I came uh, in the United States in 2010, January 2010, with my two sons because they were born here. And after the earthquake, and I came with them. I don't have any English at all. But when I came to the adult learning center, I go to I went to the uh, to the adult learning center to learn English. But I didn't know nothing about English. I I I couldn't speak. I couldn't hear. Uh, now I I started. I study and I, I have a, a good staff at Adult Learning Center. I, I have one of my uh, friendly teacher here, uh, Jody Price. That's my, my uh, high set teacher. And um, she helped me a lot to pass four, four uh, tests out of five. I just uh, have one left. I will pass. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> this, uh, uh, this uh, school uh, give me great opportunities. My, now, Cathy is my principal, but she was my teacher too. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I uh, what can I say? Thank you to the state of Massachusetts and, um, and the coalition MK. And thank you to the Buckton School community. Uh, thank you to my, uh, all my teachers and staff because with out them, my, my education or I couldn't say anything in English without them because I, I ask you to upload the, my teacher and my principal and all the staff of Adult Learning Center. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Well, congratulations, Cancery. And I want Thank to remind you. everybody, those of you that know the old GED, which is how students were able to receive their high school diploma, is now the high set test, a very, very difficult test to pass. So we're all behind you and we want to hear when you pass that final test and receive your high school diploma and certainly that filled with other opportunities along the way for you. Um, as far as what the future holds, uh, I do want to tell you that right now you're here on, uh, I believe it's a temporary protected status which is expected to expire in July of 2017. Our hope is that this administration will extend that status so uh, people like Cancery can remain here, they're productive citizens, or excuse me, they're productive residents you know, in our country and able to contribute in very positive ways. You see the two young men you know, sitting up there that came because of a, natu a natural disaster in a community that we were well aware of in the Brockton community and welcomed you know, hundreds of our Haitian residents who have added so much you know, to certainly uh, Brockton and many of the surrounding communities and across our nation. So we're all behind you 
and uh, we wish you nothing but great success, and we will continue to follow your story of success. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to invite you up for a certificate, please. And a photo opportunity. Kathy, please join us. Jody, would you like to come down and join us? Thank you for what you do. Bring your teacher in there so you have a wonderful Thank picture. You. Just. I'm absolutely, oh my goodness, your son. I have the boys come down, <laughs> absolutely. Boys, please join us. What schools do they go to? Uh, At Brockton High. High young. The youngest is um, South Middle South Middle School. Hi, young Very man. Good. How are you? How are you doing? This will be a great picture for you. Mm. How are you? Thank you. Can you squeeze in? Yeah. And that is about lifelong learning that never ends for really any of us. Okay, on to a, a wonderful presentation coming up. I will have to tell you, back in April, I went to the Mayor's uh, Youth Summit up at Brockton High School. I always enjoy seeing our young people talking about what their hopes and dreams are for our city that they are so much a part of. Well, this year, there was a special theme. And the theme, and is Andrea Burton here from the Mayor's office? Andrea? No? Then I will talk a little bit about it. So the Mayor's Youth Summit issued a challenge to our students to design a city park, uh, making the best use of what we call urban green space in our gateway city. And when I spent time going from project to project, one of the projects I saw was absolutely fascinating. And I asked this group of probably future en engineers to come to um, the school committee and share with us. And they're led uh, by their teacher. Um, their teacher's name is Mark Brady. Mark, would you please come down and join them also and talk to us a little bit about the project. And I know you have a, a PowerPoint presentation to share with us. Mark, I'd also ask you to introduce your team. Good evening. Thank you. Um, you guys want to grab those two chairs over there? Shahida here too? Uh, my name is Mark Brady. Uh, I've had the pleasure, uh, this is my second year here uh, at Brockton. It's been an absolute delight. I'm um, a change of career guy. This is my 11th year as a teacher. Um, I'm part of the Business and Structural Technology and Career Education Group um, at the high school. Um, one of the things at the high school, at, and certainly as our group, um, is to look at real world challenges, really adapt the education to um, real, world, real world issues that are facing the students rather than just books and, and uh, arbitrary examples. Um, when the Mayor's Youth uh, Summit came along, it was a great opportunity for my engineering club to focus in on one problem and really as a team uh, develop that problem to what you'll see and I'll let them present it. Um, there is a large group here. I'm going to let the team introduce them. Um, our speakers tonight are going to be um, uh, Gilson, uh, Salemi, Abdul, Abbas, and Shahida. I got it right, didn't I? No. no. <laughs> I have. I have been, my mother is Maria Josepina Antoinette Siciolo, and I have been butchering this poor girl's name for a year now. But um, Shahida, Shahida Bello is, uh, is also one of our group. Um, they are uh, part of the National Society of Black Engineers. Um, a lot of students come out of the Empower Yourself group. So I'm going to turn this over to them. I'm going to hit the clicker to move things along. Um, you want to introduce yourselves and introduce the group? Yep. Well, hi, I'm Gilson Salami, the president of the, our group here. Well, we wanted to present this part that we, decided, we thought would really better Brockton. We tried to be closer. Oh. All right. Yeah, we want to sort of move forward, make our sort of name for ourselves. This is our first project here. So we have our three here, me, Sahira, and Abdul. 
We also have back here Sadiq, Sadiq Bello, Shadonald, Aliyah, and yes. I'm always gonna forget your name, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, I'm Shafa and Shannon. Oh my god, I'm sorry. <laughs> Shannon. <laughs> <laughs> Shania, we're back here. Also, Jayla. Okay, so let's begin. Yes. So, um, the vision all inclusive park, all day use, available to entire community, multi purpose, self sustaining. Repurpose, innovator, eco-friendly. So these are the main points we'll be hitting throughout the slide. So this is basically a picture of the entire um, park. We can see starting from the middle building, that is the multi-purpose hall, and then behind it is a theater when you want like family time or just to watch a movie in the park. And the, um, the building st serves as a demarcator for um, the, the young adult side and also um, the little kids area. We see the playground over there, picnic area. Yeah, basically. And this is an area view so you can get, you can properly see the division, the size that we have, the parts of the um, park. This is a front view. You can see the um, um, hall and the other parts of the park. This is the little kids section. To the side, you can see two doors. Those are the bathrooms. Yeah. This is more pictures. So the multi-use main building. Our, this is going to be the main building of the park. We'll have we'll use cost-effective um, shipping containers that are sort of equivalent to water bottles and how they are just being left out and not used. Here's our like an ideal um, picture of it, and this will show the um, the functionality of it. We'll have offices and classrooms and top or t any types of meetings or community things that the community will be able to use. We'll also have bathrooms on either side, accessible from the outside, so we'll be able to separate the young children from the adults. And also have the center be able to use for indoor activities or like if there is uh, any type of rain or anything, so we'll keep shelter. We'll also have a police um, substation within the, yeah, so here's an example of the office, the bathroom. We'll have a police substation within the building so we'll have the presence to keep the park safe. Like I mentioned earlier, um, there are going to be bathrooms there, and to the other side, which you can't actually see, but there would also there'll be bathrooms for adults. Also, this is the little kids area. It will include changing rooms for mothers, and just to keep the kids separated for from the adults. And this is like we need more. One of the concerns we had in mind was accessibility for everybody. So. All right, so integrate technology. So uh, our main focus when we're talking about the park, we want to include technology that would be cost efficient. So meaning that we're spending less money towards the pro um, products we're buying and easier for us to use. So we want to include this product, uh, which is actually from France. And it's called the wind energy tree, which uh, looks like a regular tree. But in reality, actually, there's wind turbines in each um, each end of each brand and um, what it basically does even the uh, slowest amount of wind you put towards it it actually creates a lot of energy for the park and this is what we'll be using. Uh, we also want to include um, Tesla's products so uh, they actually had created shingles which don't look too bulky like regular solar panels like uh, I maybe one of you guys have a solar panel on top of your house, but it's just too bulky. We don't want that. We want to everything to go smooth in. 
The other thing about this is to make the park sustainable and self-sufficient. So rather than drawing energy from and cost uh, maintenance costs, we want to reduce maintenance costs as much as possible. So each one of these shingles is actually a solar panel in and of itself. It looks like a regular shingle. And the life expectancy of this shingle is three time, at least three times longer than your traditional shingle that you would have on your house. So we want to include these kiosks and uh, what these are are, um, place, are places where students or maybe people can come and use their emergency phone calls and also pro it provides Wi-Fi and internet to people so nobody is, everybody's safe and nobody's in trouble and that's the main key points we want to use this because like we can get a carrier like for example Verizon and they can help us get one of these. These are now being used all over New York City. Uh, they're free. Um, you can actually make phone calls. You can make emergency phone calls. It's a charging station. And these are uh, blue lights. So, like for example, you see in college campuses, uh, you see all of these. What the easier part is is that students, when they're in trouble or something happens, they can just push the button and immediately send it straight to the police station or maybe to the security there. And we also wanted to include charging stations because now the new generation of cars, there's uh, new cars such as Tesla and maybe Mercedes because they're starting to make it. We want to include all these different types of varieties where people can use. Uh, so rain collecting and brown water use. So um, what it, this system does, instead of using the water from the city too much, we're gonna be collecting water from uh, all the water all the water from the rain and it's going to go down to pipes where it's going to be sent to filters and they're going to filter the water and it could be sent to bathrooms in use. And this is my favorite part, uh, automated gardening system. So what this does, uh, it grows plants but um, the best thing about it, you can use it whenever you want. So you can use it during the winter, you can use it during the spring, any climate change or uh, anything happens to the environment, this will still be sustain and uh, maintain. This area that you see here pictured will grow the equivalent of 200 acres of crop in the course of a year. It's all automated, can be operated off of a, a cell phone or a tablet, so if there are times where people aren't at the park, it still can be maintained. Uh, so these are garbage trash cans where underneath them they have containers. So our main goal is just trying to make the park as neat as possible and be environmental friendly. So we want to include these where people just throw in the trash and go straight down. And what they could do, there's a uh, button where trash, people, uh, trash men can come and hit the button and uh, open the container for them and they can just unload and put it back in. So the, the base that you see the, the trash receptacle on actually rises up and the collective um, trash receptacle is actually in underneath the ground. So everything around it stays neat. You have larger capacities. Well, for the entertainment of the park, let's go. So we have uh, a picnic area where families can meet, they have picnics, barbecues, many appetizer meetings, also it's accessible to food trucks. Um, this area, yeah, it will actually help bring in a bit more revenue for the, for the city. Also, we have on the back of the main building of an outdoor theater where you can either project movies on it or we could have plays and other active events. Uh, we'll have the screen on the back of the building will be larger than you would see in this picture. So, but this is, like, this is one of the things we want to keep in a 24-hour park so we can have more than just during the day use. We want to keep people interested in the park and have them come in. Yeah. So the back of the building would actually be the projection screen. So it would be like a drive-in movie. But the best thing about it is like um, you can have meetings in there. So like for example, imagine having the school committee meeting there instead of at Brockton High. And um, that's the best way to use those containers. Yep. That pretty much summarizes it. We want to open it up to questions to anybody. I want to know when we can have our first meeting. <laughs> <laughs> actually, it's funny you say that. Uh, the mayor actually uh, has been terrific. His uh, planning uh, department is coming to the high school next week. They have two actual parks that he would like us to work on, um, and the students will be taking those parks and designing. So. Does anyone have any? Mr. Gormley? I, I love this idea. I think um, the idea of having a meeting space within a public park for the public to use is an excellent idea. Um, I've been a member of a lot of 
youth, co youth sports leagues and different organizations where we have to say rent out or uh, get space here at the high school or at another school to have our meetings. It would be wonderful to have a center just for meetings for, for groups like that. I thought that was a great part of your presentation. We wanted to make it easier for people to meet because, like you said, you have to open up schools and everything mm -hmm. to actually be able to meet. Also, other public meeting places other than the school, I'd say probably the Y or the main library, which is not always accessible to everybody, so we want to make it a more public area for people to meet. Mr. D'Agostino. I just wanted to compliment you on the great job that you did. It's, I'm, I'm actually I'm very impressed with I can imagine the amount of thought and research that went into, you know, finding all the elements to make the park self-sufficient, and um, also, you know, that it being inclusive for all age groups in the in the city. I mean, it just just a really great job, great job. Yeah, I'm very impressed with the creativity, um, and obviously, I was impressed once I saw the handicapped access. I loved that um, station where. Um, the um, child with the wheelchair was able to participate with the other students. Um, that was excellent. Um, I noticed that you always are talking about high-end cars, Teslas and Mercedes. <laughs> and, um, so I'm going to um, assume that you are going to be very successful in your life. Uh, not, nothing about a little Prius or something. You're, you're going right for the, for the gusto. Okay. I'm um, actually uh, working with Tesla in Boston Prudential Center. Uh -huh. And they actually bring me back and show me the cars and how they're made. Um, like not the pre-production like in factories, but they show me the examples. Well, it sounds good to me. Um, <laughs> Again. This, is the, uh, this is the first year for this, and, and they came to me as a mentor. And they've been a delight, a uh, brilliant group of kids, and I found that throughout the high school, um, the experience there, the innovation, um, the thought process. Um, they don't have the fears that we do of making a mistake and failing, so they're willing to take bigger risks. Uh, the group is funny, though, because they will come up with brilliant ideas. And my style, even in the classroom, is very hands-off. And they'll come up with these great ideas and then spend 45 minutes destroying it, telling each other how terrible it is, and I have to bite my tongue. Um, but this is what they come up with. So, yeah. um, well, it's very, very impressive. Proud. Very impressive. Well, thank, thank you. you. And now you can see how impressed I was when I went for a Mayor's Youth Summit and what was truly overwhelmed by, as you said, the work that went into this, what a great thing this would be for our city, and not just this. You know, the sky's the limit for you guys. You know, there's so much more. Hopefully you'll come back, continue to contribute, and be those voices out there for our young people as to what they want to see for their own families someday in our city. Oh, so one quick question about the shingles. I was, so those shingles are individual solar panels. Yeah, each it, shingle is, there's actually five styles. Okay. Um, including uh, terracotta, Spanish ter terracotta style. Each one is an individual collector. Y difference between this and what you have in your traditional roof. Your traditional roof will generate a credit with the, with the banking industry, uh, with the electrical industry. This actually directly powers your house. It goes to a, a, a Tesla has got the power packs now. They mount on the wall of your garage. You can scale them. So you can do one as just a backup system. And then as you can afford it, you can add additional ones and eventually take yourself off the grid. And what's the shelf life is like 50 or 60 years? Yeah. Wow. That's yeah. impressive. It's a recycled uh, glass-like product. Nice. And, and it's used here in the Northeast? It's, 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 a, it's a product it's that... It's not available quite yet in the Northeast, but I think within the next six months or eight months it will be. Yeah. Excellent. I know, I just redid my roof. I would have done this. <laughs> Absolutely would have done it. It is about 30% more expensive than a traditional roof, um, but when you start to figure out the life expectancy right. and then the fact that you're reducing your, um, your actual usage, not only just your bill, but your actual usage too. Um, yeah, especially basically. now when um, you know we're going to use our ACs for yep. the summertime. Um, that's excellent. I mean, it's Smart. I think it's well worth the investment. I mean, because of the obviously the energy that it's generating and it's going to subsidize your you know household bills. Uh, that's great. Very Return impressive. on investment is quick. Yeah, absolutely. Anyone else? Well, thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. Okay, moving on, um, in the previous meeting, uh, Finance Subcommittee, I did mention, as I do in each meeting, the advocacy update. On the uh, 4th of um, May, um, myself and Aldo Petronio met with Senator Brady and Senator Saldi Domenico 
uh, again on uh, reimbursement, getting 100% reimbursement for our charter for this upcoming year. The mayor has met with uh, Governor Baker on the 11th of May and continues to have discussion with him about our budget. And also, uh, I mentioned our Brockton Kids Count, Save Our Schools. We'll have a showcase on the 30th of May, Tuesday, in the Brockton High School Red and Yellow Cafeterias, where we're inviting all parents, all community members, not only to see what we have to offer, there'll be petitions, there'll be opportunities to hopefully take home a sign, a bumper sticker, things to make sure that we blanket this city so that our community, our elected officials, our state officials, you know, understand that we continue to need their support to advocate and be those heroes for our children, those advocates for education. I also want to uh, thank wholeheartedly um, our campership fundraising committee in the Brockton Public Schools. John Snellgrove approached me about a month ago and said, the campership funds that we have had to help kids go to all kinds of camperships, not only those in the Brockton Public Schools, but many that are offered in our region. It gives our students during the summer a chance to take part in a fun activity and it helps offset the cost. We found the funds dwindling. Um, Michelle Bolton, John Snellgrove, our team in the campership committee came up with what they called Cinco de Mayo. So this was on the 4th and 5th of May and held a fundraising campaign uh, at the 99 restaurant in Easton had all kinds of baskets for raffles. Many of the staff members and obviously our community members attended and money was given back by the 99 for meals that were ordered and people that said they were there to help with the campership. The basket raffles, they brought in over $10,000. And again, the uh, amount of uh, effort that went into that, I wanna thank everybody and it truly helps to allow our children to go to, uh, you know, to many of the camperships. And that being said, I do want to mention uh, John Snellgrove's mom, Kathy, passed away this past week. And Kathy was a big supporter of the Brockton Public Schools, always proud of everything that, that certainly her son did and that we did for kids uh, in our city. And my condolences go out to the Snellgrove family. Um, I also want to mention a connection, uh, Angela Henry, who uh, I serve on that board of directors, the DJ Dream Fund, contacted me this week. I put her in touch with Deputy Superintendent Thomas and our athletic director, Kevin Caro, with a group called Good Sports that is looking to donate new athletic equipment to our students in need. So I'm very excited to have that collaboration. And these are the things that, again, are going to continue to support some of the things that we were not able to keep in our budget and are concerned moving forward. So I want to thank her for that. On another good note, we received word from the Sprint Group that allowed us to do a pilot project at the high school for 500 phones. We are part of their million dollar project going forward. So an official notification will come to the school committee uh, and to the mayor in the next couple of weeks, but we've been awarded going forward 400 additional lines for next year. So that's good news for our students, it's data access, and all the things we continue to talk about when we continue to advocate for those one-to-one -one devices for our students as we move into uh, a new generation, certainly, of the need for technology. I also want to mention, um, we've had conversations before. Next week, the uh, Our Known School will be talking to the state about their opportunity to secure over $300,000 in grant funding as part of our monitor site visit um, collaboration and grant writing process that has been ongoing since January. So I just want to mention we will be interviewed as a district along with our school team. Uh, Lisa, thank you. I know you're going to be serving on that interview uh, committee with us. We're going to be talking about the grant that was written by our teachers and our staff. And I want to mention to everybody a turnaround plan encompasses four strong processes. The turnaround practice number one is looking at leadership shared responsibility and professional collaboration in a school. Turnaround practice two, intentional practices for improving our instruction in a school. Turnaround practice three, student-specific supports and instruction for all students. And turnaround practice four is a school culture and climate. So again, I want to thank our teachers, our principal Colleen Proudler, our district support team led by June Saber McGuire, Dr. Heather Ronan, Dr. Julianne Andrade, our coordinator Karen McCarthy from our Title I office, all who will come together along with district leadership to support the opportunity for that grant in our district 
and hopefully for a number of our other schools as we move forward. And these are the things that we're going to, it certainly doesn't offset a deficit, but it allows us to continue to let our schools move forward in their instructional practices. I also want to mention I attended on the 5th of May um, with Jonathan Shapiro from Brockton High School, our science department head, and Allison Ramsey, one of our associate principals representing our middle schools. We sat uh, with the Department of Education along with other urban districts talking about revisions to our English language arts and math standards and also implementing, and it's very important, our new science, technology, and engineering standards. Some of the things that you witnessed and heard here tonight for our students, those will be tested on the upcoming MCAS 2.0. I also want to mention that um, a Connect Ed call did go out to air our district families. We'll continue to remind them about the changes in the school calendar. That went out last week, reminding them that that last week of school, Monday, June 20th, excuse me, the 19th is a full day. Tuesday, June 20th, Wednesday, no, right, June 20th, Wednesday, the 21st, our half days for students, for students only half days. And the last day, Thursday, June 22nd, is a half day for students and staff uh, is the routine in closing out our school calendar. So we'll continue to remind them, get notices out, um, and letting them know about that change. Uh, also, I want to end by talking about, and I know you'll join me, it was wonderful, again, to see our spring musical and the talent. I mean, to close your eyes, you just would not believe you are sitting in a high school auditorium when you watched a production like Sister Act on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday evening. So congratulations to Bob Hogan, uh, to Matt Cunningham, to Sarah Richards, to our whole art department, to Carol Thomas, and all of those people, and those of you out there that continue to support arts in the Brockton Public Schools. We're going to need you now more than ever to make sure we continue to keep those things for our students. I mentioned right here in our school committee, I loved seeing your niece. I said to Elisa, her daughter, Hannah, I believe, in the ending uh, production, and also our own Catherine Healy, Mike's daughter. It was just beautiful to witness along with so many other students. I would venture there are over 200 that took part both backstage and certainly on the stage uh, during this past weekend. So congratulations to all of them. And my last congratulations is JROTC. Many of you join me uh, for the dining out that evening. Um, wonderful opportunity. This year it was held at Massasoit Conference Center. Um, and, and again, it was just uh, an evening enjoyed by all and showed, again, our JROTC and how integral they are in the Brockton Public Schools and everything that they bring to us. I had to leave a little early. Uh, Mr. Sullivan, I know you were there, Mr. Gormley. So I don't know if you can add to, as I said, I had to run to another event that just evening. A time, but, uh, yeah. <clears throat> and that is it for my report. I just want to remind everybody I had a number of people asking me again about budget updates. Our, our communications director, Michelle Bolton, will be putting up three areas on our web. It'll have all of the barometers, it'll have all of your budget information, and your uh, finance subcommittee uh, minutes will be up there, and some of the information that, again, explaining that $16 million deficit. I've had conversations with a number of you, so that will be up there to explain to your constituents or to uh, certainly answer some of the questions that are out there. And that is it, other than your... I agree with you more about the musical. Um, it was phenomenal. Wasn't Kathy Moran's daughter one of the I'm dancers? I'm sorry, she, Maya so? Moran, absolutely yeah, Kathy beautiful. Kathy Moran's daughter was doing a fine job. Um, it, the, the voices were just incredible. And, and what, what's amazing is, um, you know, they were, they were, there's obviously a limited number of, um, you know, leads. But you could tell that that group of students, uh, you know, there were a number of nuns that they were, I mean, the whole group of them could have been a lead. I mean, they, their, their voices, <laughs> they had so many strong singers, it, it was incredible. Um, and they were good dancers, those nuns. They were, they were very good dancers, but um, it, was, it was so entertaining. I was so impressed. Um, I just sit there and I go, my God, when I was in high school, what a dope. I mean, these kids are so impressive. Including Greg Minicello, who was on the, what was he, percussion? The orchestra, yeah. Mm -hmm. he, yeah he, he, Down he, in the pit. He, he, he was in the pit. He did his thing. But, um, yeah, just the kids on stage were just out of control. Just, just impressive. How many people here actually went could, by a show of hands? I mean, so, so you know what I'm talking about. I mean, it was just off the charts. I mean, and 
we've had some wonderful productions in the past, and um, this one is, you know, up there with with those with those with the so best, I would think. So, yep. Um, yep. my compliments to everyone involved. You know, certainly uh, the staff that was involved, and um, um, the the kids. Just the kids were. I mean, they're not kids. They're <laughs> they are young adults, and and they really. They belted it out, I can tell you that, you know, so. And, and the work that goes into it, I mean, those kids were working every night until around, I think, 10, 1030. They have to go home, uh, you know, get their studies done. I mean, the commitment of these kids for that period of time um, says a lot about their character and their drive. So, um, again, Brockton at its best, you know. I was much happier when we left the nightclub outfits to get into the nun outfits. <laughs> oh well. Oh well. So, um, anyone else? Any anyone? No. Miss Plant. I would like to say that I heard somebody had contacted um, Whippy Goldberg's publicist and um, told her that we were performing Sister Act, and I guess they received a reply wishing us well. Unfortunately, her publicist couldn't make it. She had um, a prior engagement, but she wished our students really? and sister act well. Yes. Yeah. That's that impressive. Nice. Very, Very good. Very impressive. So. This is your motion. Oh, yes, choice. we do have some tidying up. All right, so we'll move on with regard to the vote on school choice. So at the um, after, after the Finance Subcommittee meeting, we had a uh, public hearing with regard to um, school choice pursuant to Chapter 76, Section 12B of uh, the Massachusetts General Laws. And um, there were no, uh, uh, no one from the public chose to speak. Um, the school committee um, discussed this matter. There was uh, the pros and cons, and um, we uh, basically uh, uh, place the matter on the agenda for the regular school committee meeting for the vote, which is required uh, by uh, the Mass General Laws. So um, that basically is the brief report of the public hearing on school choice. Uh, motion to approve that report. Motion to approve. Uh, second. Any further discussion regarding it? OK. Oh, I guess all, all in favor of approving the report. <laughs> okay, great. So now we basically um, need to have a vote on whether to continue to participate in school in the school choice program for 2017, 2018, um, with the same criteria that's currently in place, or um, uh, whatever we decide in the future with regard to any adjustments being made. So, um, does someone want to make a, a motion to approve? Is there a second? Second. Okay, any further discussion on the motion? Okay, all in favor? Okay, wonderful. All right, um, items to refer to subcommittee. Anyone, anyone wanna refer anything right now to subcommittee? No, okay. Um, any unfinished business? No, okay. Uh, new business, Mr. Gormley. I'd like to congratulate our um, outdoor track teams who concluded their dual meet season. They're heading now into their um, invitational season. The men's team finished undefeated, and I think the women's team had one loss, even though due to weather, there was maybe four meets between them. Uh, but once again, uh, in the invitational so far, we've had some uh, athletes place really high and, and win some some first place medals uh, so as we go into this weekend with state coaches we begin the season of invitationals and interstates and I think we'll have a few more state champions to add to the roles here. And we recently had a fundraiser also. Yes we had a fundraiser for the uh, track boosters Friends of Brockton Track uh, last Wednesday went, went fairly well and uh, hoping to use some of that money to have a banquet at the end of the year for the indoor and outdoor teams. Okay. Nice. Anyone else? No. Okay. Um, I don't think there's any reason to go into executive session. Um, so, thank you for all attending. Can I have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Yes.
Second. All in favor? Thank you.